Let's start 10 years ago. Uh, literally 10 years ago was, uh, for many people, we started to ask the question, how the hell did Google do Google Maps? Like, it, if you remember the web back then, like, there was, uh, we all had web mail where you would write this long mail and you press send and it would crash and your mail would be gone. And, and Google fixed that. I mean, they did so much else with, Google, with Gmail, um, it, but autosave was magical. And, uh, and then Google Maps, like there's no way they were loading all that map in the browser at the start. They were doing something incredible. Uh, that was given a name called Ajax. About the same time, there was this new web framework that came out built on, on to what was me a new language. In fact, I didn't even see the language at the time. To me, it was all this thing called Rails. There was this Danish guy who uh, had a little squeaky voice, and he was very excited about this thing he'd built called Ruby and Rails. And, uh, and to me, the web came alive, and I was so excited. Um, but I had this problem, and the problem was, even though I could make my app be awesome on my Windows laptop, I had no idea what happened next. I, 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 I was cheap, and I didn't really want to pay for hosting, but even if you did want to pay for hosting, you know, no one knew how to run Rails apps in, in you know, 2005, 2006. Um, and the ones that said they did would charge a lot of money relative to my budget of zero. And you know, I was just making these little trivial things. So I had this, 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 this life lesson that I've sort of carried on. And it really does apply. It's, um, if you want to win in production, you, you do have to be in production. There is a joke I, I saw on Twitter once. Uh, it was uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the admin comes to the, to, the, to the developer and says, you know, and the developer says, well, it works on my machine. And the admin says, great, back up your email because it's going into production. The whole problem, you know, there are so many problems we're trying to solve here in Cloud Foundry, but, but getting your app off your laptop and into production, like fractions of seconds after you've started, I think is essential. Don't muck around thinking that the experience you're having on a laptop is at all relevant. Get it into your production environment. Um, so back then, there were a couple of barriers to production. One was, one was technical. Uh, I didn't know how to deploy Rails. The other one was institutional. Um, for many people back then, Rails was new. It wasn't Java. And they were sort of told, how, you're not allowed to. There's no, we have no way to deploy this thing. We don't know what it is. We don't know how. Uh, that led to things like JRuby, where it's like, you know what? We can hide this. Let's put it in a war file, <laughs> and they won't know. And that's very clever. Um, I approve. But for many of us, yes, uh, we have these institutional problems. Seven years ago, uh, seven and a half years ago, I was, uh, I ha I, I, at that 10 years ago, I was living overseas which I guess technically, no, I, I don't know where I live now. So I was living in, uh, I discovered Rails when I was in India, just to make this all a whole lot more exotic. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, I was pretty desperate for any, anything that might eventually be the next thing that got me out of my current situation. Um, seven years ago, I was back in Australia, and I was at, uh, at the Ruby and Rails meetup in Sydney, which is held in a pub. And... Um, it's awesome. Pub food is pretty good. And uh, this guy called Tim uh, Lucas did two talks, two, light, or two little talks. One was on SaaS, which I didn't care about. The other was this, this thing called Heroku. Oh, my Lord. Oh, he just, A, it was free. That was cool. And B, he just did Git push. Git was kind of new back then. A lot of us were playing with it. We're solving some of our, our challenges in the open source community of sharing and, and uh, maintaining branches. Um, but he used this Git tool to push the, these Rails app, and it was on the internet. It was like all my miracles had, had just become a product that was free. Ah, oh, that was so exciting. So uh, we started at, at uh, a little web consultancy, and then so we started using this for everything. Well, not for everything. That would, you know, like you don't shell Excel spreadsheets or anything, but um, write notes to your wife or anything. You, you, you use it for web apps, but every web app now went straight to, to Heroku. In fact, um, it was so simple and so implicit that we share the app, like that was a, the original Git repo, before we then go and put it on what became GitHub or anywhere else, like it was easier just to leave it on, on, on Heroku as, as a source. Um, 
So I was very excited about this whole experience. And so having had the personal pain, I, I am a developer. I like making HTML become interesting or you know, the whole experience. Um, as I've gone further down the stack in my profession that led me to this point now, uh, I have had to stop paying attention to the JavaScript frameworks. Um, I can tell node jokes, don't get me wrong. I, I can tell those jokes. I know why JavaScript is funny, but I, I've had to stop paying attention. Um, but I became super fascinated. And my mission, really, I, I grew this mission. And so when, um, oh, sorry, um, that reminds me, I get to see my slides in advance. That's, now we're not going to make those mistakes. So, um, so OK, so Heroku. Uh, the wonderful thing about Heroku in terms of winning in production was that you were in production on day one. Literally, Rails, new, app, git init, git add, git commit, push. Your basic Rails app was running. Really, uh, the only thing that we don't have now, and that story doesn't have, that I believe should be that it should have happened through CI. Like, from the day you start a new project, I'd rather every project start in CI and got deployed before you put your first bespoke commit in. Like, just that's, that's my story for the future of our, you know, what we're trying to give to, to developers. Um, so, anyway, but here we are with, with Heroku. Um, so, it worked from day one. Our consulting clients were super happy because they could now see it, they could interact, they could share with stakeholders, um, and, and financially it was free to get started. Over time, we discovered some longer term barriers to being on Heroku at the time. Um, it was still a new platform, and as you can see from Cloud Foundry, this stuff is complex, and so they would have issues. But uh, unlike Heroku, uh, unlike Cloud Foundry, Heroku is private. Uh, you can't see the code. Uh, back then, they didn't have build packs, so you didn't even know how it was running. Um, and so that was a problem. You'd then go to institutional customers, and they were still not very excited about this public cloud concept. Um, and the, the going from free to not free became expensive very quickly. Rail, Ruby on Rails applications have one attribute that, that hosting providers love, and that is they uh, love RAM. That's if you're a hosting provider, you're pretty much in the business of selling RAM, and uh, so so they loved hosting Rails apps and Java apps. Not so exciting to host Node apps, which don't just tend to have flat usage. So, um, should you wish to get into the business and wondering who your customers should be, go after Rails apps. They have no idea how to run. They like to, they don't care about efficiency, and they'll just pay you more money. Um, good business to be in. Uh, all right, and um, so that led. So I was talking in public, um, mostly about Rails and, and things, and I, I just enjoyed sharing things I found. It was I, I would go from one side of the planet to the other to do a talk at a conference to talk about some a third person's thing that I used that I thought was you know making the world a better place. I just like sharing. The, the things I find. And so uh, I was invited to come to America, which, which is here. Um, and uh, I need you to understand that, that um, for all the ways that you are mixed in, and diverse and, and wonderful group of people, this is how the rest of the world looks at you. <laughs> you don't have 11 aircraft carriers for no reason. You just like to park them around like police officers, just letting everyone know this is what we got. Um, and then when you come to the rich, diverse group, you, you, you find these sorts of characters. <laughs> <laughs> he makes me laugh so much. Um, anyway, sorry, I love America. I, I, I do, but if I, if I had a green card, if I became a citizen, I would still put that slide up. He is, he is so cute. Um, so the people at Engine Yard who uh, were, I guess, in the same business as Heroku, but one of the original people that helped make Rails apps successful, um, they asked me to come in and be part of their mission. And I was super excited. Uh, it's pro perhaps it's similar because I was living in Brisbane, Australia, which is, you know, as we discussed yesterday, it's just not America. It's somewhere else. Um, it, uh, it doesn't matter where. I mean, it does to me. Well, it does to the airline pilot. As long as he knows, we're all good. And it's funny how they like to tell you where you're going. Anyway, that's a Jerry Seinfeld joke. I'll leave him. So um, I was invited to go to Engine Yard. And it's a lot like being, if you're a banker or in finance and being invited to go to Wall Street. It's like, 
there's, there's, this, there's this brand to it. You get to go to Silicon Valley. I didn't know that San Francisco wasn't Silicon Valley. I found that out later. Um, and I found out many things later <laughs> that turned out to be not the shiny aspect of like how expensive it was to, to breathe the air on 24 by 7 basis here um, due to real estate prices. And my wonderful salary after expenses and taxes and everything. Um, but it was the, the, the two years I spent there, I, the contact with you know, a thousand production customers, as I said, mostly Ruby and Rails applications, but production nonetheless of, of web apps. This is people's businesses, livelihoods, running in production. And the, the work that the support organization did, the platform engineering group, uh, the, the configuration management group, the rolling out, the challenges we had rolling out, uh, patches, whilst at the same time, look, you know, we had many challenges and I just want to go through them. One was, you know, we wanted customers to have this experience of, of dev staging and prod environment being the same, but we, we found that hard. The way we built the platform is that idea sort of came along. Is that's what happened. Once you have your product and you start to see how people use it, you start to have the next idea. And this is certainly a next idea is you want people to go through a pipeline, but, but our platform made it, we, we didn't really have a nice way to, to extend that idea to customers. They could bring up a staging environment, but then we didn't really make it easy for them to push the configuration of what is in staging to production. Um, we didn't really have a great dev story, I guess like a local laptop version of our product. We tried different things over time. Keeping them up to date was, was not consistent. Um, another challenge we discovered over time, and I say we because I'm just gonna sort of borrow the entire corporate history of Engineard here and, and much of this I learned from our, our lessons. I, I was really interested in the, the life history of Engine Yard like, and, and, and many stories like, why do we do this? And if you followed the path, it, it was the, you know, one of the founders made this choice and, and it was undoable. We use Gentoo, and, um, which has a lot of benefits. We could own the packages, right? It was, exactly the, it was exactly what we wanted to distribute, a lot like Bosch, except we didn't have any of the tooling like we have with Bosch. We shipped one AMI in five years, and everything else was patches on, you know, at, 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 at deployment time in front of customers. Um, we, we had a leaky platform abstraction. We, sort of, we were one of the first people, uh, groups to use Chef. Like, uh, literally, Engine Cloud was being built simultaneously with Adam uh, at Chef, Adam Opscode building Chef. Like Ezra and Adam were working together on what was to become Chef, and so you know the, the idea of platform abstraction was a long way off, and so teasing that out was really challenging. And if we can't tease it out, it was really hard to provide services. I guess the prime example was a Nginx configuration file. That was where a lot of conflict happened. We had our ideas of what should go in it. The customer had their ideas of what should go in it, and uh, and they would win because they're the customer. And so it was really hard to move that, that uh, there was a bunch of little attributes of our platform that became hard to move forward because of these points of, of conflict where we didn't have nice, clean platform abstractions. Um, another lesson, um, I, I got the feeling that perhaps due to cost, due to whatever, it wasn't really, customers weren't really encouraged implicitly to do the right thing and deploy on day one. You would save that up for when you were ready because you know, it's, you're going to deploy a cluster of machines, it was cost, and, and that I don't think was the best thing for, for them. We weren't encouraging them to do the right thing, in my belief. Um, about four years ago, um, almost exactly four years ago, uh, in April, uh, I sort of mentioned this earlier today, I, I, was, I had some friends, yeah, there'd be a bit of Twitter, back and forward, friendly banter between between uh, competing companies, and there were some people at, at this company called VMware. I was never a VMware customer because I came from App World, so, um, but I knew that they existed. I knew everyone else was scared of them, and I would banter with some of their, with some of their people, like James Waters, who ultimately goes, uh, goes on in, in his own story to, 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 to you know, almost run Pivotal, and, and so a lot of them had great success. And uh, there was another guy called Dave McQuarrie, who was, is one of my good friends, and, and he, would be telling me about this thing that they were about to open source called Bosch. And I, and, and I felt like it could really solve a lot of our problems. And I went into the demo, and as I said, then the next day I invited myself. It never, it never, I didn't know that everyone else who was in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem at the time used to beg and ask and, and, and want to, you know, please, can we come meet your developers? I, I just went over. It never occurred to me to ask. Um, so 
And they were lovely. They were really nice. And they showed me a demo of Bosch for the first time. And what they had was in one terminal, one, one side of the screen was, was a terminal where they were running Bosch commands. The other side, they were showing vCenter, which I'd never seen. Um, and, and what it did was they'd run a command. He changed the size of a disk, and he replaced the stem cell in the same manifest change. And he ran Bosch deploy. And over on the other window, it went through the sequential changes to automate that. And I was like having a small party inside my clothes. And it was, <laughs> it's like this Thanks is, <laughs> it's dancing without moving. Well, I don't know what you're all thinking. Um, <laughs> this was so exciting. And so I had sort of ignored Cloud Foundry at this point, And I still really, and for the rest of my time at Engineer through the end of the year, I, I tried to put it to one side. But I did try to evangelize Bosch publicly and internally. I mean, I couldn't stop. I was very excited. You know, uh, they could ship stem cells. They had a whole build tool chain for building base images. Not just on Amazon, but on vSphere and later on OpenStack and everything else. We had nothing. We had to beg permission to, 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 to you know, the old IT thing of trying to convince that one guy who knows how to do something to prioritize your request. We had that with eBuilds for the packages for Gentoo. We had two guys with a, a sort of an unknown pipeline of what they were going to work on. And it seemed to take forever. With Bosch releases, you can do 95% of making a package work. I mean, you can go into production, and then you can go and ask for help. Like, oh, how else could I do this? What was the flag I could have used? You know, there's such a different model you can use of taking expertise and spreading it wide, as opposed to putting it all through that bottleneck. Um, all right, so uh, when it, later on, I eventually, um, I was not successful. I had run out of, <laughs> had run out of political capital. Yeah. It was a tough time, um, and so I left. And, uh, but I was so excited about Cloud Foundry, and, and I, I learned that, that, uh, that, that VMware and was going to move this Cloud Foundry thing into this other organization. I met those people, Rob Me and, J and James Bayer, and a whole bunch of people that went on to lead Cloud Foundry, and, and I was so excited. And, um, but you know, these were the things I was learning about Cloud Foundry in terms of what it was going to be like to win in production. One was it was all open source. If you needed to know what had just happened, it was all there. Um, this was exciting. Institution, running in your own data center. We're still three, four, five you know, years ago, the idea of running your own data center was a foregone conclusion. Of course you were. What was the point of being a CIO if you couldn't go and build a data center? That's like, what else are you supposed to be doing with your job? Um, that's, it's like corruption in India. It's like, that's the point. Like, I want that job so I can be as corrupt as my boss. And I don't mean to just say India. There are a lot of corrupt countries. Um, like America. I mean, it's not called corruption here, it's called lobbying, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just trying to, there's a whole chain of these, and I'm just trying to stop and not, not say them out loud. Um, stormtroopers are coming. Stormtroopers, thanks. Let's build a wall to stop them. Um, <laughs> Um, oh I, I actually read many years ago Donald Trump's, one of his first books, and uh, he, he, was, he was really successful. He was doing really well, he said, and uh, it was a good book. So, you know, not only was it open source, but there were vendors, and not just one, but many coming along, and, uh, and the next part was, was super important. As a developer deploying, the experience was going to be the same for five years. I mean, you've got to think. I used to joke that a Rails app, because that's what I used to do, Rails New was how you start a new Rails app. And it was so simple to get started. I had this feeling that it should come with a, with a health warning. Like in yellow, blinking text, warning, you are creating a production app. Do you wish to proceed? Like, just because it's easy doesn't make it right. Um, but it is easy, and it's our responsibility to catch them all and, and, make, and help make you know, our developers successful, to let them uh, create success in their organizations for their end users, and ultimately, you know, I, I strongly believe that the world CEOs in the next 15 years are going to be heavily populated with people who came through our profession. Um, we have to let that happen uh, for their own company's sake. So a lot of winning in production that came from Cloud Foundry. So I left Engineer, I started Stark and Wayne, and it's a pure metric that we're doing well, that, you know, this is more representative of everything. Like, this conference has grown, the number of conferences has grown, the number of people that want to participate. We are a magnet for, you know, 
a path to success. Um, so one interesting thing was just in, you know, this, I don't have access to everyone's deployments of Cloud Foundry, but just looking across some of our own customers, there are like 5,000 apps deployed by the end of last year. Uh, like within that year, many of them started earlier on the year. Um, and so there are just so many little metrics of success that I can have my opinions all day long. And so like we didn't, like in the front, there's a man called Wayne Segwin who his job at Engine Yard in the day used to be helping to deploy Rails apps. Like a customer would come along to the engineyard.com website and say, I'd like help deploying. And there was no magical script. It was handed off to Wayne. <laughs> Wayne wrote the magical scripts. Like back in the day, it was all manual. And I didn't touch any of these. I mean, not one person in the ops team from Stark and Wayne or, or you know, GE or Swisscom, or with it, we don't do this. They do it themselves. This is an incredible future. It creates incredible problems. And they are different talks. Um, when you've made deploying apps easy, you now need to make every other attribute easy as well and self-service. Self um, all right, so then the story goes on. I, I, uh, I moved to Australia. Somewhere in the last five years, it started being called Australia, which I think is pretty cute. Uh, that's, that's not a picture of my house. That is as representative of how bad the internet is. Um, so I miss America and your, your internet. Um, and I started working on, on sort of production things that you know, would sort of um, perhaps the ideas we've learned over, I mean, this story, 10 years, seven years, wherever you want to start my story. Um, we've learned a lot of things and uh, we're trying to find different ways to help. When you're a consulting company, you only sort of get to help five or 10 customers and all their users at a time. And to my mind and our mission, that's not sufficient. So we're going to try different ways to try to help more people. Um, that's pretty cool. So we have uh, like a few minutes uh, about, I don't know how long we have. We, I have no idea. We're going to do a quick demo. For the people who have not seen a CF deploy, I just want to go through and talk it through. This is a Rails app um, because many of you are Java people and I'd like to expose you to, to diversity. Um, so uh, this just happens to be where I'm deploying it. This is, I guess, Pivotal's Ops Manager and it's you know what, it's free to download and use and play with. So if you want to play with something, it's kind of fun. Um, all right, so we, we're going to build a Rails app. I um, cannot. All right, so it's, this, is, this is an experience you want to make so simple for everyone else that you're not there. I mean, I don't know if I can say it any other different number of ways. This is what we're trying to do, is to let people move on with their jobs without creating tickets, asking for help, um, and, and to, you know, you just count the success by looking in CF curl. I don't know if you've ever used CF curl. It's a wonderful way to get the data from inside Cloud Foundry. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. All right, so we're making a little Rails app. And this is a screencast, so I can't skip this bit that you don't care about. But I did this screencast for the benefit of a group of Ruby people. And they love seeing Ruby and HTML fly across the screen. It's their little thing. And I don't wish to take it away from them. Um, Puma is, is a framework that's pretty popular in, in the Ruby space now for being efficient at hosting your app. Um, so it works locally. That's great. But as I said, we need to get off our laptop as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you're going to start thinking that your massively powerful laptop is somehow representative of production which is we're not giving you that much capacity in production. So this is it. You just point it at your Cloud Foundry, where, whichever one it is, and it's done. It is just incredible. And if it's not done, let's say you have a problem. Now you know about it. Do you remember how painful it is when you package up in an envelope your code? And OK, that might be, you know, but you hand it over the wall to the IT group. They don't know what to do with it. They give it back. It, that is ridiculous. There's a whole line of empathy that I, I espouse. Give developers more empathy, a room for more empathy for the end user, for their own, the operations experience. They're the best people to fix so many problems. Um, so here we are. These are the logs that you've all seen. Um, if this is new to you, uh, happy to sort of show you other examples afterwards. I'm sure many people have seen this before. But we'll go through a couple things. Um, because I want to tell a story. So as we go through, um, we pause here for no reason. Oh, this is, I mean, as, as, as the guys, the Springer uh, Nature guys are saying, um, 
No, no need to set up DNS, no, it just works. SSL, TLS uh, is just done, uh, not <clears throat> by deployment, but you know, you sh as operators, you would turn on uh, HTTPS, please. You know, the, 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 the build packs, we can write our build packs in such a way to teach our users what to do next, right? So the Ruby build pack teaches users to say, go and install this gem. Why? Well, currently, no one can see your logs because you're writing them to files. And that's one of the things all our users discover first is they can't see their logs because they're writing to files. We need you to write them to standard out and standard error. There's a simple way in Ruby. We just tell them what to do. So we try to educate them to solve their own problems. Um, it's asking us to be explicit about what we're running, so let's do that. And this, you know, these little hooks of how we can communicate with our anonymous users. And we don't, you don't know when they're doing this, right? You can't catch them. Like when someone decides they're going to start a new web service, you're not there to sort of go, no, 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 don't do that, right? Um, so we have to make this as, as, as resilient as possible um, and, and let them be a little bit successful and let them be more successful over time, right? Our warnings are going away. And if, and if your build pack that you, your team doesn't, that uses, like whether it's Spring or whatever, doesn't have lots of nice help, add it. I mean, that's a wonderful place to participate in, in Cloud Foundry is to f flesh out the build packs and make them, um, make your users more successful. I love the CF scale command. Conversely, I don't like it when the old IT departments would say, all right, you're about to deploy an app. Let's just all relax. How much capacity do you want? It's like, what are you talking about? I don't know if anyone's going to use this yet. I have such low self-esteem that I am not ready to answer your question. Um, so you start small. Now, it is a good idea to start with multiple because then as they get killed and restarted, you always have one running. Um, I still don't think today there is a way to set a default of two. So that's something to teach your users about why to have two. Logs, oh my lord, giving you developers back their logs can only breed empathy for those who are going to read them in production. Logs tell a story of what just happened, all right, after you want to know about it because you don't look at the logs. It's like visiting a doctor's office. You're there because something's wrong. The only time you're looking at logs is something's wrong. You need them to tell you a story at that time. I would very much like developers and, and PMs and, and, and the, the stories that go you know, you, in your backlog to have a, and this is what the logs should look like. Um, and over time, that, that level of empathy, I think, will, will grow into teams as, as that DevOps loop, which is a DevOps is a communication and, and, and team aspect, more than a fancy word, uh, builds out these ideas of what, what do we need from developers so we can do a better job? Um, or developers, do you want to be on call all the time? How about that? No? No? Great. Then do some decent logs um, so they can see their own logs. Doesn't make it any easier. By the way, if, if your Cloud Foundry doesn't have a nice place to, to collect logs. Uh, I, I like to use paper trail. It's just a, a SAS thing. You don't need to ask permission. I mean, you might like to ask permission, but you can just go and create an account um, and quietly connect it into your app. At least you can see your logs. You can, be, you know, you can win. But paper trail does have a nice set of, of Cloud Foundry documentation on what to do. Using the uh, says CF cups, that stands for create user provided service. Um, so that's the mechanism which you can register uh, you know, syslog endpoints, so all the logs will drain out. And hopefully over time we start to see service brokers streaming service instance logs through that as well, so you can tell that full end-to-end -end story. We bind it and Cloud Foundry, it's just a special mechanism for telling Cloud Foundry to stream logs for your app and you can collect them. because. You know, at, again, once, at the time that you want to see your logs, um, they're not going to be available, you know, so you want to store them. Uh, you may have your own favorite, a uh, SAS, or you may not think of using SAS, a uh, hosted uh, syslog, but it's ridiculous to wait for someone to set up Elk. Like, you, you, you've got a production app, so this is a, a workaround until you have something you like. I mean, also, I like this experience. The Kibana experience isn't, I'm not a big fan. There's our, uh, there's our app. 
And again, just, just as a developer, think through the story, think through the user story of what's support going to be looking like. All right. The last thing I want to show uh, in this demo is, is the SSH command, and we'll skip that and get to the last slide. The, you have CFSSH, which means you can get inside one of your containers and, and have access to the environment, which might mean you can run one-off tasks, like migrate databases and those sorts of things. So um, if your Cloud Foundry hasn't upgraded to Diego, CFSSH command is one reason that's the best reason, you know, the actually value-added reason to, to move to Diego is CFSSH. All right. Um, so, in summary, uh, we have winning in production. We want to elevate developers. Don't, you've got so, only so many great people. Stop doing undifferentiated heavy lifting. I borrowed these from, from uh, uh, Adrian from, uh, from Netflix. Um, his are the ones on the right, mine are the ones on the left. Uh, turbocharger developers. Speed in, in all our marketplaces is what wins. Foster empathy. Uh, let, you know, encourage developers to run what they wrote and be responsible for it. And uh, not enough people have talked about Docker yet. As the buzz died down, no one's, I don't think any of the keynotes you know, say the Docker word. Uh, you can push Docker apps. So if you need to prove Cloud Foundry is awesome, show the demo and then go back to never using it again. But uh, so, all right, thank you very much. Have a great day.